Father, it's such sweet news that we could uh, even sing holy, holy, holy in the very next words, be merciful and mighty. Uh, we struggle so much, I think, to make sense of, of your mercy and your might uh, in light of your holiness and our sinfulness. But I praise you that we can rest uh, knowing uh, that you are good with us uh, through the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, uh, we are continuing in our series in Exodus, and if you want to find a a specific chapter, uh, you can go to chapter 24. We'll be covering the entirety of chapter 24 this morning. Now, for a number of Sundays, and it it actually stretches all the way back to the um, beginning of uh, all the the virus, you could call it that now, the virus, Uh, we were in the law just before we kind of had to uh, separate for a while, Um, and then when we came back, we kind of recapped uh, the law, and we've been looking through the book of the covenant this week, we get back in chapter 24, a, a kind of the familiar narrative or the storytelling uh, of Exodus uh, that we've been in, and it's specifically looking at uh, the, the scene of the covenant being confirmed with the people of Israel uh, at Sinai. Now, what I want to do today is consider the, the covenant elements uh, that are laid out for us in this story, in this narrative. Then I want to consider the, the context of this covenant in the history of Israel itself. And finally, uh, we'll look to see how this history affects the way we see our own salvation. So first, uh, let's look at the elements uh, of this uh, confirmation of the covenant. We're going to read through Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to stop along the way and explain or highlight some of these elements. So Exodus chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. Then God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall, come, shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Now, just a quick note here. Uh, as we think of what's about to be uh, seen in the tabernacle structure, we see this take place here on the mountain, uh, where the people are at the, at the base of the mountain. Moses and uh, Aaron and uh, his sons, the soon to be the, the priestly Uh, people of Aaron, they go up along with 70 of the elders. They go up a certain way of the mountain, and then uh, Moses himself only goes into the cloud, into where where God is on the top of the mountain. And we see this in the tabernacle, uh, just with the 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 setup of the tabernacle where the, the common Israelite is allowed into the outer court. The priests are then allowed into the holy place and only the high priest, and at that only once a year, is able to go into the most holy place, that most inner place. And it's just an interesting thing because as we think about uh, the story of of the Exodus and the story of uh, the Israelites, we think of uh, God as being close to man, closer here than we've seen him since Eden. He's there with him with them, but they are still so very separated from him. He is there in their midst, but they can only approach at certain levels. Even earlier on in the story in chapter 19, we see that anyone, any person or any beast that were to even step foot on the mountain was to be stoned. So we see this separation, even in this closeness. That's just a quick note. The uh, good, the, the good story there, the gospel there, is, of course, uh, that in Jesus Christ's death, the, the curtain to that uh, most holy place was ripped in two, uh, giving us a confident access to the throne of grace. And that is a completely different sermon, so I'm not going to continue on with that. But continuing on with verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. 
we give, we give Israel, uh, I think, a lot of grief here. At least I know I have in the past, given them a lot, a lot of grief for uh, hearing the law and then saying, yes, all of this we will do, we will obey. But I'm not, uh, as I consider the entire scene, I might not be very fair to the people of Israel here. Prior to Moses going up the mountain, we read this in chapter 19. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The people didn't immediately think of the commands as something attainable necessarily. I don't think they even thought it through to that extent. They were simply scared to death. They were scared. They were gripped with fear. In fact, we see in Deuteronomy 5, as Moses retells the events at Sinai, he says, As soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fires as we have and have still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. So even before they, Moses comes down from the mountain and, and reads to them or tells them at first the, the commands, they are already terrified. They've heard the voice of God speak and they tell Moses, okay, kind of leave us out of this because he scares us, and we don't dare even listen to any more of what he has to say, because surely we will die. So you, Moses, you go up, you find out what God has to tell us, come down here, and we will hear it, and whatever you tell us that God has said, we'll obey. It sounded like a pretty good deal to them. They were terrified. What's interesting is in that same account in Deuteronomy, the very next verses follows up with God's response to them. Through Moses, he says, I have heard the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. On that they had such, uh, oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. We'll touch on this more later, uh, but it is right. It is right to stand before God with reverence and awe. In verse four and the following, uh, we see the confirmation of the covenant take place uh, through a ceremony. So continuing on verse four, we read this. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of, of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient and Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. We see that this confirmation ceremony uh, is, is a very bloody ceremony. And we shouldn't be surprised because everything that we're about to see laid out and even what we've already seen it is a very bloody story, and there is lots 
of blood involved in the animal sacrifices that are going to be prescribed to the people. They are a nation that will be surrounded uh, from uh, the beginning to the end in blood. Blood plays a, a big part in the Old Covenant. The people are experiencing this up close and personal as, as Moses takes half of the blood of all these animals that have been sacrificed and, and sprinkles it, showers it upon uh, the people. And uh, you probably would be happy if you were near the back at that point and not the first few rows. 24 9 continues. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. These, uh, these four, 74 men were allowed to perceive some form of God on the mountain, at a distance, and yet God did not lay his hand on them. This, this means God did not kill them. They came up beyond what the people were allowed to come up. They perceived uh, some form of God, and they lived. And they ate. This is kind of very uh, typical uh, of, a, of this forming of a covenant, this confirmation of a covenant. Covenant. Uh, God, though, was not sitting there eating with them, but they were eating in the presence of God. They had a peaceful interaction with God in the sense that God did not strike them dead, and they were able to enjoy a meal in his presence. And surely this uh, meal is from the sacrifices that had just occurred, much like the uh, the, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb that the family uh, enjoyed together. Now, though it's not explicitly spelled out, it appears that after this covenant meal, the entire group went back down to the people. And then from there, Moses and Joshua alone go back up the mountain. And on this visit to the mountaintop, Moses would receive the sign of the covenant uh, represented in the two tablets of stone. So continuing on, verse 12 the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up into the mountain of God and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we, re we return to you and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. I'm not going to get into it now because we'll cover it in a, a, couple ch a few chapters, but that sets up the golden calf. He tells them right there, if you have a dispute, if you're with anything, you come to Aaron and her and they'll settle it for you. And we'll find out how Aaron settles that sadly uh, in a few chapters. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. We read this ancient ceremony uh, and ritual and it's, I think it's easy to sometimes just dismiss it as just that, kind of ancient history. We would never, uh, we have a hard time in our day and age imagining a ceremony uh, like this take place, especially when we consider all the blood uh, involved. But this covenant between God and Israel has major implications uh, and has been the subject of debate really in, from the early church to our, the present day. The question is, what place does the law hold for us now? And when I ask that question, I'm specifically speaking about the, the moral law, the Ten Commandments that are summed up in Scripture as you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And we have to understand 
with that summary statement, those two clauses, those two clauses are exactly that, a summary of the law. They in no way relax the law. It might sound a little bit easier because it's shorter than what we're given in the Ten Commandments, but they are a summary of the commandments, that moral law, but they in no way relax it. But in some ways, uh, the question about the law's relevance to us now, I think probably is not the best starting point for us to understand it. The question seems to assume that there is a difference uh, between the law then and a difference between the law now. So I want to look at the context in which this covenant of the law was first received, uh, and then we will look at it uh, in our own present-day context. So prior to the giving of the Ten Commandments in Sinai, we saw in the beginning of Exodus a people who were oppressed in Egypt. They were slaves. And we read this at the end of chapter 2. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for, rescue from, uh, their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. We're familiar with the story from there is, God performed wonders and miracles uh, in the midst of the people of Egypt and the the people of Israel. Uh, We think of all the plagues and uh, specifically the Passover, where he spares the people of Israel through the uh, application of the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. The angel of the Lord passes over the land and the firstborn in each household dies unless that lamb had died in their place. He brought them out of Egypt Uh, If you remember the scene, the Egyptians are finally saying, please leave at this point. They're showering them with all of their gold and jewelry, and they're ushering them as quickly as possible out of Egypt. And the next thing we know is they're stuck between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. And yet God brought them through the Red Sea. He provided a way of escape when there was no apparent way of escape. He opened up the waters and he brought them through the sea on dry ground. And we remember the story of their wanderings, how he provided them with food and water. And in the third month after their departure from Egypt, at the foot of Mount Sinai, God says this, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The point is this. The people had already been saved out of Egypt and already had the blessings of God before the law was given. God did not give them the law in Egypt as some sort of life preserver. Hey, hey guys, I see you're suffering under the yoke of slavery in Egypt. Here, obey this law, and if you do it perfectly, you'll get saved out of this slavery. No. God simply, out of his own gracious will, saves them out of the land of Egypt. He rescued them by grace alone, through faith alone. It had nothing to do with their faithfulness and everything to do with his. This is made clear when God spoke to Moses in chapter six. He says, I am the Lord I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, 
I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give to you for possession. I am the Lord." It sounds an awful lot like what I read out of Ephesians chapter one this morning, where it's all the God, all of God working for our salvation. Lots of I wills through, there, through this statement from God. The giving of the law at Sinai was after the promises already made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was after God had already graciously rescued them out of the land of Egypt. This covenant at Sinai was not a new covenant, and it in no way supersedes the covenant given with Abraham. This covenant simply makes it more clear who the God of their salvation was. The commandments of the moral law revealed for the first time a written code of God's holy standard for his creatures and revealed God to them. It revealed his holiness to them. The display at the mountain that caused the people to tremble, the, the fire that they were afraid of being consumed by, that holiness was mirrored in the commandment. It revealed that the God of their salvation was not like the false gods they had seen in Egypt who could simply be uh, satisfied with obedience or piety from imperfect and sinful people. He demanded, and he still demands, perfect, personal, and perpetual obedience to his law. There's, there's no room in the law for good intentions. There's no room, uh, as, as Ryan preached at the very beginning of this series, there's no room with, well, I really tried hard. Trying hard is not good enough. It can't hack it. There's no room for good intentions in the law. The law, though, still worked to reveal the sinfulness of Israel as they, as they fell short. It still worked to restrain evil. And for those of true faith among Israel, as we see in, in Hebrews 11, there were those of true faith in Israel. Although the, the nation as a whole rejected God, there were those who had faith. And for them, it became the law became to them a rule of life. This is why we have read so much in the Psalms and as we were reading through Psalm 119, how many times did we hear, I delight in your law. It, it seems like a contradiction in some ways, I think, because of the way we've come to understand the law. How in the world can I delight in the law? The, the song, one of the songs we sang earlier, it said, make my, make my heart your, your uh, throne. And you were, we're called in, in Corinthians that the temple of the Lord. That is such, when we think about that, that seems like such a contradiction. How can we, who we know are just wretched and vile and sinful, how could we possibly be the throne of God. How could the holy God dwell within us? The law, though, was never meant to save. And as Paul speaks about in Galatians, indeed, it cannot save. The power for salvation does not lie in the law. As we've already seen in Exodus Immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments, God gave instruction concerning the altar and sacrifice. In revealing their sins, the law was meant to drive Israel to their Savior who had already saved them, not through the merits of the law, but through his own gracious choice and promise. And in their sin and misery, as they feel the weight of that law, they would turn to him in worship and specifically in animal sacrifice in this blood that we've talked about. A death of something would have to, 
take uh, place. It's a death of an animal in their place. Uh, because as lawbreakers, they were condemned to death. And the preamble to the law in Exodus 20 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Just reiterating, I give you these because I have already saved you. Israel was meant to stand in reverence and awe before their holy God and his revealed law. They were meant to see their complete inability to meet his holy standard and see through eyes of faith their need for Christ. But as a, as a nation, Israel missed this. They missed it completely. They forgot the place of the law in their own history. Although already saved from Egypt, from the house of slavery, and although already blessed by God and called his people, and he their God, they insisted on turning to the law as a means of their salvation. And even, though, uh, even through this, God pursued them. One author wrote this. I love it. He says, The inescapable truth is that the grace of God continues to shine upon a people whose major claim to fame is the suicidal ability to break the covenant. We read the history of Israel, and we, we keep putting the hand to our head, thinking, why do you keep doing this? But it, it is so hypocritical. Because we do the same thing so frequently. But they, they certainly had a way of constantly looking to the, the law as the means of their salvation rather than realizing that God had already rescued them. They continually regarded the covenant uh, but saw in it only, only the covenant of works. And the covenant of works that was given to Adam, in which Adam failed to keep, and that we are all failures in the keeping of that covenant of works through Adam, they kept looking at the law, and the law certainly hints and points back to that covenant of works with Adam, but they, keep, they kept looking to the law as their salvation. They blindly held to, to it in this regard rather than seeing the types and shadows in the law that pointed them outside of themselves. Because the truth is, as we consider the entirety of Scripture, Christ was present. Christ was present at the covenant at Sinai, but Israel failed to consider Christ in the covenant. So we come back to the question, what place does law hold for us now? Again, we're speaking of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the truths they held then for Israel are the truths that they hold now for us. For the unregenerate, they reveal our complete and utter sinfulness and ability to have a right standing before God. In them, we see his perfect holiness and our wretchedness. But that knowledge in and of itself does not save because the very light of nature and man, as the confessions say, reveal to them that there's a God and it reveals that we fall far short of his glory. And anyone who says otherwise is allowing themselves to be deceived. So we consider the very light of nature and man. We know there's a God. We know we are guilty. We know that we don't have peace with him. But that in and of itself will not save. It's only having already been saved justified, declared righteous on the basis of Jesus Christ's fulfillment of the covenant of works and his atoning death on our behalf that we can perceive the law through eyes of faith. We see the law no longer is our salvation except that Christ has fulfilled it for us. But we see in it the majesty of our most holy God. It was set before the people of Israel as the mountaintop displayed in living color, the words on the tablets display to them that God is holy. It displays to us the same thing. Our God is holy, holy, holy. We see in it ever increasingly our own sinfulness. And again, in faith, we see ever increasingly Christ 
and our need to run to him. We see it in a rule of life, in we, which we, along with the psalmist, can delight in. But as is clear in the New Testament church and even today, we have a sinful tendency to do just what Israel did with the law and run back to it as a means of our salvation. We try to attach it to our salvation. And it makes sense because if we're going to have a man-centered system for salvation, well, those laws kind of fit very well right there. Now, of course, there's some uh, hoops you jump through to kind of explain your guilt away, to explain your sin away. But you systematize it and you say, yes, if I, if I do this, then I will live. I will be saved. I'll be right with my God. And even we do this from time to time. Our hearts are wretched. We look to the law and we consider the law rather than considering Christ. And when that happens, we have to, we have to consider it a nightmare and wake up and run to our heavenly father for, for comfort and for peace, for rest. And that rest is found in Christ alone. So as we move to, to communion, I want to consider uh, the, the reverence and awe that Israel demonstrated at Sinai. They, they stood there fearing uh, the fire of God on the mountain. They, they told Moses, it'll, it'll consume us. They told Moses, just even hearing the word, of the, hearing God speak, we're liable to die. Please just go Go listen to the words yourself and come back down and tell them to us. They were gripped with fear. But I want to read what the author of Hebrews has to say about that scene. Uh, we've touched on this passage before as we look at uh, the comparison between Sinai and Zion. He wraps up his, uh, the passage, passage in chapter 12, verse 28. He says this, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. God does not stop being a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. And we as believers though we are now adopted into the household of God, that does not mean that God is any less holy. And as the author of Hebrews said there, he put salvation first. He said, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And because of that, he says, and thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. This is, this is sanctification playing out in the life of the believer. As our faith is strengthened, we lean more and more on him and how that looks is obedience. We delight in the law of the Lord and we will obey him, not perfectly, it is certainly imperfect in this lifetime, but he is sanctifying us. This is one of the benefits, the rich benefits that are ours in Christ. He is sanctifying us, building us up to be his holy people. He called the Israelites a kingdom of priests. Well, guess what? Peter calls us the same thing. We're a kingdom of priests and God is making us holy, even to the point that we will be glorified with him that we will one day in his presence perfectly keep the moral law. Perfectly delight in the moral law. Perfectly delight in our Savior. A, com a comment uh, on this Hebrews 12 passage says this, reverence and awe before his holiness are not incompatible with grateful trust and love in response to his mercy. God remains a consuming fire, so we must revere him even under the new covenant. In fact, we have more reason to do so, for in Christ we better know the majesty of his character that allows him, the perfect judge of all, to forgive us. And this is what we're celebrating as we 
celebrate the Lord's table, as we partake of these uh, communion elements together, we are taking them as the family of God before our holy God, worshiping him. We no longer worship him through the blood of bulls and goats because that was only a type and shadow pointing to our real need of Christ. We drink the juice as a, a, but a symbol of the blood of Christ that was poured out on our behalf. The sacrifice that Christ made that once and for all sacrifice is done and we celebrate and we enjoy and delight that our God is holy and that we get to be called his children. This is the life in Christ. And we come to this table every week, every Sunday in faith and assurance that God has saved us, that his promises to us are sure and true. And only because of that, we obey in the presence of his holiness. Fleeing from the very thought that that obedience in any way gives us any shred of credibility before a holy God. And I think that's the very thing that a, a holy God reveals to us, that our obedience could never be enough for him. Our obedience even now rests fully in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let me pray, and we'll enjoy the table together. Father, I, I praise you that we... Uh, as your people, we get to come together around the communion table to celebrate uh, what your son has done for us. You are holy, and we have no right to enter the throne room of grace with confidence except through the blood of the lamb, the blood of your son. We have no way to do that except through his perfect obedience on our behalf. So even now in the communion table, as we consider your holiness, and as we consider you the judge of all, and yet so, per so graciously and mercifully condescending to us to rescue us, uh, not only a wretched people, but a people who are your enemies, help us to delight in you, to delight in Christ and his perfect work. Help us to find our boast in him and him alone. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.